Hello and welcome back everyone we we online and today i'm going to continue the story what if naruto and femq be were lovers part 3 if you enjoy this video please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload now wasting no more time let's begin at the shinobi academy a new year had just begun as he ran toward the academy naruto ignored the looks and scowls that were directed at him He was wearing his orange monstrosity and had a big smile on his chibified, whiskered face. When he got to the room with his classroom number on it, he threw open the door and walked in. Several of the other students inside looked over to see who had come in so loudly. Some of them were blinded by the bright orange jumpsuit the blonde was wearing, and more than a few wondered if Naruto wasn't color blind. Why else would he wear a color so ugly and bright? Naruto didn't care about any of this as he walked toward an empty seat in the back so he could watch the class. He sat down and spent the rest of the time pretending to be an idiot while sneakily looking at every interesting student in the room. Naruto saw seven students who stood out the most among the other 26 students. A kid who could have been a younger Itachi was sitting in the front left corner of the room, looking bored. He had black hair that was spiked in the back, which made the blonde think of a duck's behind. He wore white shorts, blue shinobi sandals, and a blue shirt in the style of the Uchiha clan that had his clan's crest on the back. He was looking out the window at the moment, and all of the girls in the class were giving him a dreamy look. Naruto thought it must be Sasakai, Itachi Nisan's younger brother, because Itachi had told him about his brother a few times when he took Naruto out for ramen. Two more things caught his eye in the middle row on the right. A tall kid with long, jet black hair pulled back into a spiky ponytail. His brown eyes were small and had a lazy, half-closed look to them. His clothes were pretty simple. He wore a green-lined mesh t-shirt under a short-sleeved gray jacket with green edges and a circle with a line through it on the sleeves and back. He wore brown pants and blue sandals. Naruto frowned as he thought about the Nara clan and brought up what he knew about them. If I had to guess, I'd say it's Shikaku's son. If he's anything like the notes my grandfather wrote about Shikaku, he'll be the perfect example of a lazy genius. I remember them, Akane said. Even when they first moved to Konoha, that clan was the laziest group of people I'd ever seen. They make the Sanbi look like hard workers, and that damn turtle is the laziest son of a bitch I've ever met. Naruto laughed at her comment, which made a few people look at him. He didn't care about them and kept observing. The only thing that could have been next to the Nara was an Akamichi. The kid was very big, which was important for Akamichi clan techniques. He had brown hair and swirl marks on his cheeks. He wore brown shorts, a long white scarf, a green jacket with short sleeves over a white shirt that said "food" in kanji, ring earrings, and bandages on his legs and forearms. I'll go out on a limb and say that this kid is the heir to the Akamichi clan if Nara is Shikaku's son. A girl who caught his eye was not too far from the two clan heirs. The girl's blue eyes and long blonde hair which was cut shoulder length and had two short bangs framing her face were the things that stood out most about her her clothes were a short purple shirt with a high collar that looked like a vest a skirt with the sides cut off and bandages on her stomach and legs she also had on purple and white arm warmers she was clearly from the yamana clan since she and he were the only other people in konoha with blonde hair and blue eyes he couldn't help but wonder why an 8 year old would wear clothes that showed so much skin Naruto's mind wandered to Akane and he thought it's not like she has anything to show off. Before he could turn red in the face, he kept looking around the room. A brown-haired kid sat a few seats away from Naruto. He looked wild and some of his behavior was like that of an animal. He had messy brown hair, black eyes with pupils that looked like vertical slits, big canine teeth, and nails that looked a little bit like claws. On his cheeks, he also had the red fang marks of the Inazuka clan. Naruto knew for sure that it was Sume's kid because he had only seen the woman a few times around the village. She was one of the few people who treated him well. His clothes were dark gray pants that went down to his calves and a gray coat with a fur-lined hood. Naruto knew that the boy was an Inazuka because he had a small white puppy on top of his head. A girl with dark blue hair, fair skin, and white eyes with a hint of lavender also caught his eye. The eyes had no pupils, which meant she was from the Hyuga clan. which was one of the most powerful in Konoha and the Uchiha clan's rival. Her hair was cut in a hime style with strands that reached her chin. She wore navy blue pants with a cream-colored hooded jacket that had a fire symbol on the right and left upper sleeves and fur around the cuffs and hem. 
Naruto thought it was funny that the girl seemed so scared of everyone around her that she was trying to hide in her jacket. That, or she was just trying to act like a turtle as best she could. The boy sitting next to him was the last person who really caught his eye. This kid had dark, bushy brown hair, pale skin, and, when he wasn't changing, he seemed to be the tallest kid in class, other than himself. He wore dark sunglasses and a sea green jacket with a high, turned up collar and a hood that he pulled up to hide most of himself from the rest of the class. Naruto thought he was an Aburame because he heard a light buzzing sound coming from him. The Aburame clan used bugs to fight. The only other person who caught his eye was a girl with bright pink hair and an unusually big forehead. I mean, what kind of shinobi would have pink hair? Naruto thought it was the two Chunin instructors who walked in when the door opened and two people came in. The first was a man with brown hair pulled back into a ponytail. He had dark eyes and a scar across the bridge of his nose. He was dressed in the standard shinobi outfit for Konoha, which included a forehead guard, sandals, and a flak jacket. The other was a man with white hair that reached his shoulders. He wore a bandana-style headband to cover his forehead in the standard shinobi outfit for Konoha. Okay, class, calm down, the man with brown hair said. The class seemed to settle down, eager to learn more about the world of shinobi. My name is Aruka Amino, and this is my assistant Mizuk, the man said. I would like to welcome all of you to the start of your first year at the Shinobi Academy. Each of you is here because you want to serve and protect Konoha as a ninja, and we will do our best to help you all become the best ninjas you can be. This made many of the students smile. Now, when I call your name, I want you to come to the front and tell us why you want to be a shinobi. Aburame, Shino, as Naruto's classmates were called, he ignored all but eight of them. The seven clan heirs, who all came from the most powerful bloodline clans in Konoha and the girl with pink hair, who he thought might help him keep up appearances. Naruto thought to himself, with so many important clan members in this class, it looks like it will be fun. Uzumaki, Naruto, Naruto looked up and saw that both Mizuki and Aruka had angry looks on their faces. As he walked to the front, the blonde thought, this is going to be a long four years. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, the blonde shouted with a big grin. I'm going to become the best Hokage so that people will look up to me and respect me. D E T T E B A Y O. His announcement was met with stunned silence for a few minutes before the whole class started laughing out loud. Yes, it's been a long four years, Naruto sighed as he went back to his seat, and he wondered how the boss was doing. Akane said, Hey, Naruto kun, as Naruto kept going through the katas of the Kitsunken style of Taijutsu. After two years of long hours of practice, Naruto's muscles remembered how to move. Now, all he had to do was work out the kinks and get in better shape. Yeah. Naruto asked with a grunt as he flew through a fast kata in which he hit his imaginary opponent with lightning fast knife edged jabs where the floating ribs would be. As he moved back out, he jumped into the air, turned around, and gave his opponent a heel kick that would have hit him in the neck. When he fell back to the ground, he kept doing his katas. I was thinking that since you're going to be traveling so much, you might want to find a way to make money. I was thinking about that, too. 10,000 yen is a lot of money, but it won't last forever. Naruto paused as he kicked with his left and right feet together while spinning on the balls of his feet. I was thinking about selling my seals. Not only do I have a lot of seal designs, but most of the seals I found at ninja stores were garbage. Akane laughed a lot as Naruto went on and on about how bad the seal paper, ink, and seals themselves were. The paper they use is of terrible quality and has creases all over it. The ink has no special properties and tends to fade within a year. And don't even get me started on the seals themselves, they look like a fucking child drew them. The red head decided not to say that Naruto was a child, even though that was true. Instead, she just listened to him talk about something he was clearly passionate about, even though she didn't know what he was talking about. I don't mind if you sell your seals. Since not many people can make them, it could be a good business. Akane paused, but you should keep your most powerful seals to yourself so they don't fall into the hands of someone who might use them against you. Also, we'll need to find a way to protect your seals so no one else can copy them before we sell your customized ones. Naruto told her, that's why I'm going to start hiding my seals in things like the Uzumaki clan symbol. Seal masters often hid their seals in other things, like the Shiki Fujin, dead demon consuming seal, on Uzumaki's stomach which was shaped like the clan symbol of the Uzumaki clan. That's a good idea. I'd suggest making more copies of yourself to start working on it right away so you can start making money soon. 
Naruto had already been thinking like the vixen, so he made 50 more clones and told them to start looking for a way to hide his seals. After a half hour, Naruto finished his taijutsu keita and walked over to where he had left his towel. He picked it up and used it to wipe the sweat off of his body. Okay, it's time for your kenjutsu training on the ceiling. Naruto sighed as he took out his bakken and did what he was told. He knew it would be a long night. Iruka said, all right, class, when he was done talking about the shodem hokage. It was a boring talk about the man's mokaton, wood release, jutsu and how he started the village, at least Naruto thought it was boring. I want everyone to go outside with Mizuki to the training logs. It's time to start target practice. Everyone in the class, including Naruto, jumped out of their seats and ran outside. They ran into Mizuki, who looked at them all and scowled at Naruto before he told them what to do. When I call your name, I want you to take these kanai and throw them at the training post, he said, looking at his clipboard. Abarame, Shino. One by one, they all went up, and most of them did very poorly. Very few kids hit the log, and most of their throws went out of the circle. Even though a few people got lucky. The clan heirs, or at least most of them, did good things. Shino, Kiba, and Sasakai all did well enough. Shino got 9 out of 10, Kiba got 7, and Sasakai got all 10. He even threw them all at once to show off, which made his fangirls very happy. Ino, Choji, Hanada and Shikimaru, however, did not do as good. Ino got 3 out of 10, not only was her aim completely off but her throws were weak. Choji got 5 out of 10, which wasn't bad and he had strength behind his throws, but lacked accuracy. Hanada's hand was shaking so hard that she only managed to get 2 out of 10, and left with her head in her jacket to hide her embarrassment, and Shikamaru didn't even try, claiming it was too troublesome and ended up getting a 0 out 10. Mizuki said, Uzumaki Naruto, only Naruto heard the light growl in his voice, which made the blonde wonder why this man hated him so much. Naruto shouted to Sakura Haruno, a girl with pink hair who was wearing a red kipao dress with white circles on it, with or without sleeves, and tight dark green shorts, hey, Sakura-chan. Look at how awesome I am. After the first two months of the new year, Naruto decided to keep up appearances by acting like he liked this girl. Sakura yelled, shut up, Naruto no baka, as her face changed color to match her hair. She violently shook her fist at him, which she always did when he was too far away to hit. The girl was one of Sasuke's biggest fans, along with Ino Yamanaka, who Naruto thought let down her clan by caring more about Sasuke than getting better at being a ninja. The pink-haired girl was perfect for Naruto's idiot act because she was a civilian and very violent. Naruto walked up to where Mizuki was and took the kanai from him. He didn't pay much attention to the fact that they were so dull that even if he hit the target, they probably wouldn't stick unless he used chakra to make his throws stronger. He wasn't trying to hit the targets, so it didn't matter. The blonde, orange-clad genin missed each kanai even though he pretended to aim carefully. Everyone around him laughed and started making fun of him because even civilian kids got one. Naruto pretended to be angry that all the kids were laughing and moved back into the crowd. Iruka started another lecture as soon as the class went back inside. Naruto groaned and told Kami, I hate the boss. I wish I were with him instead of here. As Naruto kept training, the months went by quickly. He went from being able to make 200 clones to being able to make 300. Again, this increase in Cage Bunshin made a big difference in how many jutsu he could learn. He was very proud of what he had done and couldn't wait until he could show everyone how strong he really was. He had also finished making the designs for his seals, which he decided to hide inside a symbol he had made himself. The symbol was basically the Uzumaki clan symbol, but the swirl looked like it was made out of a fox's tail. Even if they took the time to look at the seal when they saw it, most people wouldn't be able to tell what kind of animal it was from its tail. He just needed to find a store where he could sell his seals. A young man with red hair that was spiky and had bangs that reached his jaw and a fringe that covered his forehead was walking down one of Konoha's many streets. He looked to be about 18 years old. He had dark purple eyes, which are rare in any country. He was about 6 feet 5 tall and had an athletic build that showed he had spent a lot of time training. He looked like a ronin samurai because he was wearing a traditional dark blue kimono and black hakama pants underneath. The only things he wore on his feet were tabi socks and waraji sandals. He was very good looking, with a chiseled face that gave him an air of mischief. If you didn't know he had red hair and purple eyes, you might think he was the Yandaimi Hokage based on his general face shape and hairstyle. When he smiled, 
A few of the women around him went weak in the knees. This made the men around him frown. He didn't care about the people around him, not that he did. The young man was too busy looking at all the stores, trying to find a good place to sell his clothes, to notice that the women were staring at him with drooling eyes and the men were giving him scathing looks. Let's see Kinsei's fine weapons, nope. Shinobi Central, a bunch of jerks I'm not helping, the young man sighed. Damn, I can't find any shinobi stores near here where I can sell my seals. Oh, what's this? He stopped in front of an unremarkable building with a kanai and the words, Higurashi's Weapon Shop, written on the top of the door. Young man went into the shop because he was curious. When the young man looked around, the first thing he noticed was that the place was a shinobi's dream. There were some of the most beautiful and well-made weapons he had ever seen all over the walls and on several stands in the store. He saw everything from axes and lances to ninja twos and even some broad swords that were said to have come from the east during the Second Great Ninja War, which happened many years ago. It was clear that the store was serious about its job of giving ninja the right tools. Can I be of help to you? When the young man with red hair turned, he saw a man with a bull's head. Big and made of bricks like a shithouse. The redhead could see muscles on every part of the man's body. He even had muscles on his muscles. He had dark brown hair that was cut into spikes and brown eyes. He wore an off-white shirt, brown pants, and brown boots. Maybe, said the young redhead with a casual smile. I came here because I saw your store and thought we might be able to work together for both of our benefit. Oh. The big man said curiously. The redhead nodded and said, this is a beautiful store, and I've noticed that all of your weapons and shinobi clothing and armor are of the highest quality. I did, however, want to know if you sold seals. If so, how good are they? Do you make seals? Asked the big man, who seemed both interested and curious. The redhead laughed and said, Yep, I've been going to the elemental nations to learn as much as I can about fuaiinjutsu. I've been looking for a place to sell my seals, but it seems like there aren't many stores in this area that know good quality when they see it. The big man agreed, there are a lot of stores that sell cheap equipment, and then he held out his hand and said, Kaizuki Higurashi. The red-headed person took the offered hand, shook it firmly, and said, Urashi Kazama. Kaizuki nodded and said, I take it you have your seals with you? Yes, Urashi said. Then come with me to the back and show me what you have. If I like it, we can make a deal. Kaizuki-san, I like the way you think. Nearly two hours later, Urashi left the Higurashi weapons shop, and both he and Kaizuki were happy with the deal they had made. The owner of the large weapons store had been very impressed with the quality of Urashi's seals, which were, as far as he could tell, almost perfect. It took a while, but in the end, they came to an agreement that worked for both of them. Urashi would give Kaizuki's store all of the standard seals, and any new seals he made would only go to the Higurashi weapons store. In return, Kaizuki gave Urashi the better part of the deal by giving him a 60% cut of the profit on all of the seals sold. At first, it was 50-50, but when Urashi told Kaizuki that he was using his own custom-made paper and ink, which were both expensive to make, the man gave. Urashi yawned loudly and stretched his arms above his head as he closed and locked the door to the hotel he had rented. Long day. Urashi laughed when he heard the voice, and then his skin rippled, his hair turned from red to gold, his eyes went from purple to blue, he shrank to 4 feet 6 inches tall, and he put on all black shinobi clothes. It wasn't like a normal day, Naruto said as he looked around the nice hotel room. He went to the kitchen and looked in the fridge to see if there was anything good to eat. When he didn't find much, he sighed and decided he would use his Arashi persona to go out and get something to eat later. For now, he would just go into the seal and spend some time with Akane. We must strike now Hiruzen said an old, frail-looking man with one hand on a cane. He had black shaggy hair, and his right eye was always bandaged. He had an X-shaped scar on his chin, which was given to him when he was young. He wore a white shirt under a brown robe that went from his feet to just over his right shoulder. The robe covered his right arm, which was bandaged and covered with three big golden braces. Hiruzen Serutobi gave his old friend a frustrated sigh and said, We can still talk to them, Danzo. Why are you so set on killing people from our own village when all of this can be solved without needless killing? Since Serutobi became Hokage, Danzo had grown jealous of the man, who he thought was too weak to be a good Hokage because he stuck to the same ideals of peace as the Sho and Naidame Hokages. He couldn't help but think that if he were Hokage, none of the problems they were having now would be a problem. Danzo was known as an old war hawk, 
because he was an extremist who preferred to eliminate threats directly through assassination and execution rather than through diplomacy and negotiation. He was also a fanatic about the ideals of a shinobi, believing that they must sacrifice everything for the village. You've been talking with them for almost four months now, Serutobi, he said, fighting the urge to frown because he had to keep up his reputation for being emotionless. How long will it take you to realize that Fugaku is not interested in talking? Since the Kayubi attack four months ago, the Uchiha clan had been acting strangely. Their shinobi were acting nervous and secretive. Most people remembered that Madara Uchiha had tried to use the Kayubi as a weapon by summoning it and trying to control it with his eyes when he fought Hashirima Senju, the Shodem Hokage. No one really knew how the battle went, only that Hashirima had won. Since the attack almost nine years ago, things had been getting worse and worse, to the point where Serutobi had his most trusted Anbu, young Itachi, spy on his own family. What the child prodigy found was disturbing. Hirazan. I know you don't like bloodshed, especially in our own village, said Kaharu, an old woman with squinting eyes who wore a simple long kimono with an obi, a jacket, and a sash over it. But the Uchiha clan is planning a coup, do you really think you can stop them? Even though she was old, or maybe because of it, Kauharu was a very confident and strong-willed woman. She believed that the group was more important than any of its individual members, which often put her at odds with the third Hokage. Because she was much more aggressive than the Hokage she worked for, she tended to agree with Dan's. Even you must see that trying to settle this through peaceful negotiation is impossible, said the last person in their small group. Homura was an old man with gray hair, a beard, glasses, and a constant frown that he wore even when he was young. He also had a strong jawline and facial structure that he managed to keep even as he aged. Homura was a dictator who always had the best interests of the village in mind. Like Kaharu, he was more aggressive than the Hokage he worked for, so he often sided with Dan's. Serutobi sighed as three people attacked him at once. He didn't know what to do. He didn't like having to kill people, especially people from his own village, but he also knew that they were almost out of options. Hokage-sama, I'm willing to do this job, Itachi Uchiha said. Everyone turned to look at him because he was the one who had just told them what they needed to know. Itachi, are you sure you want to do something like this? To kill your own people? Asked Serutobi, his face filled with shock. Itachi closed his eyes and a small look of pain crossed his face as he thought about the Third Great Ninja War. He remembered how many lives had been lost because of all of the pointless bloodshed. Ever since he had seen war for himself, the young Uchiha had become a staunch pacifist and supporter of the Sandame's beliefs. However, he knew that if it was not possible to avoid bloodshed, the best way to protect the innocent was to crush any form of violence as. When he opened his eyes, he looked at his Hokage and said, I think this may be the only way to keep from killing even more people. If the Uchiha clan pulls off this coup d'etat, win or lose, Konoha will be weakened and the other hidden villages will attack us like a plague of locusts. You're right. Hirazan said with a tired sigh. Itachi Uchiha, I want you to wipe out the Uchiha clan before they can plan their coup d'etat. You need to do this right away. Hi, Hokage-sama. Itachi bowed and disappeared in a cloud of leaves. He would do as he was told, but he had one more stop to make first. Naruto Uzumaki was woken up by a loud knock on his door. He grumbled as he got out of bed and walked into the living room, changing into his chibi form as he went. When he opened the door, he saw Itachi standing there, and he knew right away that something was wrong. Are you alright Itachi Nisan? Naruto asked with a worried look on his face. Itachi said with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes, Yes, I'm fine, Naruto-kun. Do you mind if I come in? Not at all, Naruto said, moving out of the way so Itachi could come in. The two of them went into the kitchen, living room, where Itachi sat on the couch and Naruto sat in a chair. Why are you coming to see me so late at night? Itachi asked. Itachi didn't answer right away. Instead, he took a moment to look around the room. He had been to Naruto's apartment several times, and it never ceased to amaze and annoy him that the blonde, who had become like a brother to him like Sasakai, was given such a terrible, run-down dump. It was the one thing he hated most about Konoha. That they would treat their hero with such disrespect. Shaking his thoughts away, he turned to Naruto and said, I'm going to have to leave the village soon. The blonde tilted his head at the cryptic comment, but he didn't say anything because he knew better. Before I leave, I wanted to give you something and ask you for something. Um, okay, said Naruto, wondering if he should ask Itachi why he was leaving. 
Itachi pulled a scroll out of the front left pocket of his flak jacket and threw it to Naruto. First, he said, that scroll has the knowledge of every jutsu I've ever learned. There are more than 500 of them in there. The raven-haired soon-to-be traitor smiled at Naruto's shocked expression and said, I know you are stronger than you let on, Naruto-kun. The fact that you can get away from every Anbu officer who chases you for hours tells me that you are smarter than you look. Hey! Naruto said with a sheepish smile as he scratched the back of his head. I guess I was wrong to think I could trick you. Is anyone else aware of this? No, Itachi said, shaking his head. Even the Hokage doesn't seem to know that you are much more than you look. When you don't want people to see you, you are very good at hiding in plain sight. Thank you. Naruto said as he looked at the scroll and wondered what secrets it might hold. What was your request? Itachi began, as I've already said, I'm leaving the village soon, and I'm worried that Sasakai will get into trouble. You know my little brother, right? Yeah. My class, arrogant attitude, black eyes, and black hair in the shape of a duck's behind, Naruto said without thinking. I know him, the blonde said, looking at Itachi. You want me to befriend him or something? You do know that I've already done that, right? Itachi winced when he thought back to the times he said Sasakai could be a good friend for Naruto. His brother had told him that their father had said the whiskered blonde was a monster and couldn't be trusted, and that a clanless orphan like Naruto wasn't worth befriending. That's fine, I guess, Naruto said with a shrug. I'm used to being hated by now. The Anbu with the raven hair winced again. Do you know why Itachi Nisan hates me? He asked. I, Itachi paused, thinking about what he should say. He didn't want to lie to Naruto, who had already been through so much, but he couldn't ignore the Hokage's order. I'm sorry, Naruto-kun. I do know why you are hated, but I'm afraid I can't tell you. Can't, or won't. Naruto already knew why he was hated, but he wanted to test Itachi because he was the only person who treated him like a human besides Akane-chan, the Ichirakus, and Serutobi. He also had to keep up appearances, Itachi may have known he was stronger than he let on, but even he didn't know how strong he was or that the Kayubi was helping him. Can't, said Itachi. There is there is a law that says anyone other than you or the Hokage who talks about why you are hated will die instantly. Naruto thought about all the times he had been beaten in the past, he had seen every single person who beat him the next day as if they had done nothing wrong. I guess there's nothing to it then, he said, deciding to move on. So what was it you wanted me to do? Itachi said, I want you to keep an eye on Sasakai. I'm afraid that, because of our father, he will follow in the footsteps of our ancestor, and when I'm gone, no one will be there to make sure he doesn't fall to darkness. Well, I don't know if I can stop him from falling, Naruto said. However, I will do my best to keep him in the village. That's all I can ask, Itachi said as he stood up. I hope we'll meet again someday, Imaudo. Later, Itachi ni san, Naruto called Itachi as he disappeared. How do you feel? Something is going to happen tonight, Akane said, knowing exactly what he meant. I think something bad is going to happen, and from what Itachi is saying, it's going to happen to the Uchiha clan. Good riddance, thought Akane, trying to keep her feelings from getting into the seal. She had never liked the Uchiha clan, after Madara had tried to turn her into a slave. She hadn't put up with that, of course, and was the real reason Madara was dead. She could tell you that cooked Uchiha didn't taste like chicken because she had tried it herself. Think we should go see what's going on? No, shouting, Akane said, trust me, whatever is going to happen is going to happen because of forces outside of you. And you don't want to be around when whatever happens happens, because people might try to link you to whatever happened, which would not be good. He slowly said, yeah, I guess you're right. Of course I am, now go into the seal. Tomorrow, we'll learn what happened to the Uchiha clan. As Akane had said, Naruto found out what happened to the Uchiha clan while he was on his way to school that morning. Did you hear? They say that last night the Uchiha clan was killed off? I wonder if the devil did it. I thought the same thing, but it turns out it was one of their own. Yes, Itachi Uchiha is the prodigy of the Anbu. Naruto kept channeling chakra into his ears as he walked to the academy. Itachi Uchiha had killed the entire Uchiha clan in one night, except for his little brother Sasakai. Naruto now understood what his brother figure meant when he said Sasakai might follow in the footsteps of his ancestor. As news of the Uchiha's destruction spread, everyone was quiet in class that day. Naruto noticed that Sasakai wasn't there and couldn't help but wonder what happened to him. Naruto thought to himself, of all the things I could have thought Itachi would do, 
I never thought he would destroy his own clan. Itachi was the only Uchiha that Akane respected, because he was the only one she had ever seen who didn't give in to the darkness of his cursed eyes. I don't know why he would kill everyone in his clan. Naruto asked in shock. He didn't like the Uchiha clan, he hated them, in fact, but it was wrong to kill them all. They might have been fighting the Hokage. I know you don't like killing Naruto-kun, but the Uchiha clan is full of traitors who would betray you in a heartbeat if it gave them power. You talk about them as if you know them, Naruto said with a frown. Oh, I do, Akane said in a dark voice. Madara Teme tried to use me in his fight with the Shodem in the Valley of the End. Idiot thought he could control me with his eyes, but I showed him that I'm not to be messed with. Wait, 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 are you saying you were there when Madara and the Shodem fought? Akane laughed and said, the Shodem only fought for about an hour. When Madara realized he was losing, he summoned me and tried to take control of me. Akane still didn't know how that man had managed to summon her. She thought it was some kind of space-time ninjutsu, but she wasn't sure because she didn't know much about human techniques. Naruto was joking when he thought, Aruka sensei would die if he found out that the Shodem didn't kill Madara. Meh. I told him to just mention me in passing. By that time, people had forgotten the truth about us Biju, and many only wanted to use us as weapons, or they were afraid of us because we were strong. I guess. Naruto was quiet for a moment before his curiosity got the best of him and he asked, so you know Madara well? Knew. I knew him decently, Akane said. I didn't know much about the man personally. I'd only met him a few times before he came to try to get me to join him against Konoha. But I know his family, very, well. Really? Yes, I did make the Uchiha clan in the end, he said. Naruto was so surprised by what she said that he fell out of his chair. When he got up, he rubbed the back of his head in a sheepish way as he drew the attention of a few of his classmates. Most of them just snorted and ignored him, or laughed at him, but that didn't bother him because he was already known as a prankster and an idiot. You made the Uchiha clan, right? Asked Naruto when he was back in his seat and had gotten over his shock. Yes, Akane said, not seeing any reason to hide it. I gave the first Uchiha his Sharingan eyes about a thousand years ago. It was during one of the many wars I and the other Biju were in at the time. This war, on the other hand, was nothing like the Shinobi Wars. Naruto was fascinated by the story and had to ask, what was different about this war? Naruto was surprised by her answer, but he didn't say anything while she talked. Because this war wasn't between humans, it was between demons and humans, she said. At the time, there were a lot more demons, and the portals to the underworld weren't shut like they are now. Me and the other Biju led the war against the demons who threatened our lands. Wait. You and the other Biju are also demons, right? Why do you side with humans? Naruto asked. We may be demons, Naruto-kun, but we aren't like most demons. There was a long silence before the demoness spoke again. My kind was made by the gods themselves, and each of us took on a part of our creator. I was made by Inari-sama, the god of foxes. Because of this, my demon form is that of a fox, and I am smart and love to play tricks. Kami sent the nine of us down here with the job of protecting her creations. Most demons are made from the souls of the damned, whose hatred was so strong that they turned into monsters. Kami or any of the other gods did not make them. We were different, and that, along with our duty to protect Kami's creations, the humans, led us to fight alongside them. However, we couldn't win on our own, and even though we had a lot of humans fighting with us, the sheer number of our enemies was pushing us back all the time. We realized that the humans couldn't win without more power, and we couldn't use our demon forms because we didn't want to hurt those who worked for us. At that point, we decided that we would choose champions for our cause. We would give humans we thought were worthy some kind of power that would give them an advantage in battle. This is how the first bloodlines were made. I was the one who made the Sharingan and gave it to the man who started the Uchiha clan. Wow so, why do you hate the Uchiha clan so much? You mean besides the fact that Madara tried to use me for his own purposes? Why do you dislike the clan? Akane asked, making Naruto blush a little bit. Because of what it has become. The Uchiha clan of today is proud and has a sick sense of superiority. They think that Kami gave them to humans and that they are the only ones who can rule. Just thinking about how corrupt they have become makes me feel sick. Other than that, Akane's voice became much softer and had a regretful tone. I know from your memories that the people who hurt you the most as a child were from the Uchiha clan. It's okay, Akane-chan, Naruto said, 
knowing that she felt bad about what they had done. I don't blame you, and to be honest, I couldn't care less about what happened in the past. In fact, I would thank the people who hurt me because they brought you to me. Akane turned a pretty shade of pink, and she was glad that Naruto wasn't in the seal with her to see it. She mumbled, thank you, just as Aruka and Mizuki walked in and the lesson started. Naruto continued to act like a fool in front of everyone for the next year. After what was called the Uchiha Massacre, things seemed to get even worse for the blonde. He didn't let the Anbu catch him when he played jokes, and he moved to a different room in the abandoned apartment complex where he lived because he was getting attacked more often. Since that day, Sasakai had become even worse. Before, he was arrogant and liked to show off, but after Itachi killed his own clan, the raven-haired academy student had become dark, brooding, and emo. He wouldn't talk to anyone, and the few who tried were either ignored outright or yelled at by the last loyal Uchiha, as the people of Konoha called him. It didn't help that the civilians and Konoha council started fawning over the broody revenge-driven boy. Many of them were probably only doing this so they could get Sasakai to marry their daughters and become part of a clan, which would give them more power. Naruto wasn't sure if that was the main reason for the rise in Sasakai fans or if the girls in his class thought they could heal his wounded soul, but he had overheard several of the. What about Naruto? Give me a futen jutsu. Naruto moved quickly through several hand seals and ended with a horse seal. He took a deep breath and then spit out a tight ball of wind. The wind ball shot forward at a high speed and hit one of the many training dummies in the training field. Akane made the blonde do this jutsu silently, just like he had to do all the others. A Katen jutsu. The blonde ran through the gauntlet as he ran through the seals for the jutsu he wanted to do. Taking a deep breath, Naruto blew out a large fire dragon that roared in what sounded like anger before charging one of the training dummies. It hit the dummy and exploded, leaving nothing but ash in its wake. He had kept training pushing himself past what normal people could do to get stronger. This year, he had gone on a hundred bandit raids and had to fight two C-ranked missing nin who Naruto had found had a bounty in Konoha's bingo book. He was able to get the bounties from the two ninja using his alias as Arashi Kazama, a wandering swordsman with a talent for seals, without anyone in Konoha. Even the Sandame, who gave Arashi the money for his first bounty, couldn't tell it was Naruto. Unlike the Henge, Naruto's transformation was real, not an illusion, so not even the Byakugan or Sharingan could see through it. The only people who could tell something was off when he used it were demons and Jinchuriki who had full control of their demons. And speaking of his alias, the seals he had been making and selling had become a great way to make money. To keep his cover, Naruto would make Arashi while he was away from the village, then have him come in through the north gate, where he had to fill out several forms with his name, age, and reason for visiting. After that, he had his business persona leave, then come back six months later to see how much money he had made from the seals he had. Since then, Naruto has made sure that Arashi comes every two months to bring more seals and has given Kaizuki some of his older custom seals. Now, Naruto has a steady income and makes more money in one month than most people do in a year. Do a Raiden Jutsu. As he trained his Jutsu, his fingers moved in perfect sync. When he was done, Naruto slammed his hands into the ground, and a large bolt of lightning tore through the landscape as it headed towards the last training dummy on the field. It hit gold, sending sparks everywhere as the dummy broke apart. That's enough training, Akane said after Naruto had spent four hours doing nothing but firing jutsu. Even for someone with more chakra than the current Hokage, firing so many jutsu in such a short amount of time while having 400 clones create seals and do whatever else he wanted them to do was tiring. You're going to need to buy some new training dummies, she said. Well, they're kind of fried, Naruto said with a snort. All 200 of them are gone. I'll send a cage bunshin to buy some tomorrow. That's fine, we're done here for now, said Akane. Get cleaned up and come into the seal. Naruto stood back up and stretched. He took a moment to look around at the training ground he was now using. His habit, place where he learned. Naruto bought the apartment complex he lived in under the name Arashi from an old man who wanted to get rid of it because no one wanted to live near the demon. Since there was no one else living there, Naruto took one of the rooms on the first floor as his own and let his Shishio Bunshin use his to keep up appearances. Naruto's apartment was more like a small mansion. It had a training room, a bedroom, a bathroom, a living room, a kitchen, a swimming pool, a library, study, and a swimming pool. Unlike most apartments, there were no real walls between the different parts of the house. Instead, there was a staircase that led to the bedroom and bathroom, 
which was separate from the rest of the house. Naruto had just left the training room, which he called that because he didn't have a better name for it and that's what he used it for. It was mostly gravel and grass, with a section with a lot of trees and another with several small bodies of water, the deepest of which was only about 5 feet deep. It was the biggest part of his house, and Naruto practiced his nin, tai, and case skills here. The kitchen was just a kitchen, with stainless steel counters and brand new appliances. Thanks to Akane, the blonde with whiskers had learned to eat healthier, so he liked cooking and bought himself all of the newest appliances. Also, the living room was a large carpeted area with several leather sofas and couches, a coffee table, and a few potted plants to make the room more interesting. The room wasn't very interesting, and Naruto didn't spend much time there. His swimming pool was more like a lake with a waterfall. It was about 60 square feet and had a large waterfall like the one in his mindscape. The water was constantly being recycled as it went up to the waterfall through pipes where it was superheated into steam and purified before coming down the waterfall as fresh spring water. His library was basically the Namikaze library that he had just moved from his father's house. It was made up of several large bookcases filled with the nearly 1,000 scrolls and books that Minato and Kashina had collected when they were alive. It was in the back of his flat, across from the training ground, and had a large redwood desk so it could also be used as a study. The last part of the flat was the bedroom and bathroom, which were only separated by a thin wall for modesty. The bedroom had a large king-sized bed with soft red sheets and pillows, a large walk-in closet, a dresser, a nightstand, and a lamp post. The bathroom had a large jacuzzi-style tub with two shower heads on either side, a toilet, and a sink. The whole apartment room took a few months to build, and it wasn't just because Naruto had to have Akane cast a powerful kitsune illusion that she had woven over the building to make people think it wasn't the Kyubi Bratz apartment complex. This was done so that people wouldn't get suspicious when dozens of clones of himself in different henges came in to work on the building. Early on in his study of seals, Naruto started to change them to suit his needs. One of the seals he made was the expansion seal, which took the idea of the sealing scroll, which created a pocket dimension within a piece of paper, and took it several steps further by creating a pocket dimension within another space. There were 12 of these expansion seals in Naruto's apartment. Naruto spent the rest of the night in the seal with the person who had helped him more than anyone else. Since summer was coming, she decided to take it easy on him and give him a break, she told him more stories about her past and some of the battles she had been in before Biju were feared. When two people carrying the forehead protector of Kirigakir no Sado came into Konoha at noon, it was the middle of the day. Considering the rumors about the civil war going on in Kiri at the time, that would have been strange on its own, but what got people's attention was how different the two things were. The person in front of me looked to be a woman in her mid-twenties who was thin, she had auburn hair that reached her ankles and was styled in a herringbone pattern at the back. At the front, she had a topknot tied with a dark blue band and four bangs. Two of her bangs were short, and one of the short ones covered her right eye. The other two were long and crossed on her chest, just below her chin. Her eyes were a light green. She was wearing a dark blue dress with long sleeves that stopped just below her knees. It had a zipper in the front to close it, and the right front side from the waist down was left open. Only the tops of her arms and the bottoms of her breasts were covered by the dress. Under the dress, she was wearing a mesh shirt that covered more of her upper body than the dress, but it didn't reach her shoulders, so it still showed a lot of cleavage. She also wore shorts that were the same color as her dress and, underneath those, mesh leggings that went down to her knees. She wore a belt around her waist that had a left side pouch on the back. She finished off her outfit with a pair of sandals with high heels and shin guards that went up over her knees. She also had dark blue polish on her nails and dark blue lipstick on. Many men would say that the woman was the epitome of beauty. She had a happy attitude and a beautiful smile that made her look even better. Even so, she carried herself with the grace of a leader who had been a shinobi for years. A man with short, tufty blue hair and dark eyes was standing next to the woman. He also had sharp teeth like a shark's. He was wearing square black rimmed glasses that seemed to be connected to headphones, he also had on a blue pinstriped shirt and pants with a camouflage pattern. He also wore a forehead guard, which was attached to the front of the holster he used to carry a big sword with two handles. The blade of the sword is wrapped in bandages, so only the double handle can be seen. On each of his legs, he had a holster for a shuriken. But the biggest difference between these two wasn't their gender or what they were wearing. The woman looked like she was sure of herself and had all the traits of a leader while the man seemed shy and held himself in a way that showed he didn't have much confidence. 
This difference was what really set the two apart. S sign here, please. The voice got the attention of the two Kiri ninja, who turned to see two Chunin staring at the auburn-haired woman with their eyes glazed over and their mouths drooling. The one who was able to say something was holding a clipboard that was slipping out of his hands. He had been holding a pen, but it had fallen to the ground a long time ago. The woman sighed as her bodyguard grabbed the pen and signed them both in. She was used to being treated this way, even when her country was at war and people were looking at her in a lewd way. Luckily, they only came from her enemies, since her own shinobi knew what happened to people who looked at her with such lustful eyes. She only wished she wasn't here on a diplomatic mission so she could melt the minds of the men who couldn't stop picturing her naked. Have a good stay, as she walked into the village of Konoha, the Chunin's dumbfounded voice only made her snort. As she walked through the village, the woman with auburn hair looked around and thought it was pretty. The village hidden in the leaves was called that because it looked like trees were everywhere in the village. From where she was walking, it was easy for her to see the Hokage Monument, which was a mountain with the faces of the four leaders of the village from the past and present. The mountain looked out over the whole village. People of all ages were playing, talking, and generally having a good time. The whole village had a calm feeling that no one would have expected from one of the five great shinobi nations, let alone the one that was thought to be the strongest. She really wished that her own village was this quiet. Now, if she could just get rid of all the men who are staring at her, everything would be perfect. As they walked through the village, the man with blue hair asked, Titarumi S. Sama, shouldn't we find a place to rest? No, the woman said. I want to make an appointment with the Hokage first. They were already getting close to their destination. The Hokage lived in a big mansion close to both the Ninja Academy and the Hokage Monument. It was also the tallest building in Konoha. After asking a Jonin who was stuttering and blushing for directions, they went in the front door and took the stairs all the way up to the top floor, where the Hokage's office was. When the auburn-haired beauty walked up to the front desk, she coughed to get the attention of the woman working there. Can I help you? She asked with a jealous look on her face. I was hoping to set up a time to see the Hokage, the woman with auburn hair said with a friendly smile. Hold on for a second, the woman said as she went to the door and opened it. There was some muffled talking before the woman came back and said, Hokage-sama is available right now. Thank you, she said with a happy smile, even though she thought the woman was a B asterisk TCH, she couldn't help that she was more beautiful than the other woman. She took a moment to figure out where she was as she walked into the room and up to the desk where Hirazan Serutobi, the Sandame Hokage and the man called the Professor, was sitting. She didn't think the man was weak just because he was old. After all, he had led a village through two great shinobi wars and was still strong enough to lead after being retired once. She curtsied to the Hokage as a sign of respect, trying not to let her bust move too much because the old man's eyes seemed to be focused on it, judging by the slight blush on his face. Even as she said, it's a pleasure to meet you, Hokage Dono, my name is Mei Terumi, she thought, what a perverted old man. It's nice to meet you, Mei San, Serutobi said with a friendly smile, trying hard not to look at her bust. My secretary told me that you want to talk to me about something. Yes, Mei replied. Serutobi nodded and said, usually I would make small talk, but based on what I know about your country, I don't think you want that. Mei agreed no and took a deep breath before going on i'm here to ask for your help my people are being oppressed by the yandaimi mizukage and the yugura and many of the bloodline clans that kirigakir holds are on the verge of extinction as a country that values its own bloodlines i'm sure you can understand the situation we're in serutobi thought for a long time and then said i can understand how your people feel but because of the kayubi attack eight years ago we are still rebuilding Right now, I don't have enough people to protect my village and help you in the war. I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine, Mei said, keeping her smile on even though she was starting to feel sad. She had hoped that the bloodline-loving village would help her, but it looked like she was wasting her time. Just as she was about to leave, the door burst open, and what she thought was the funniest thing she had ever seen walked in. A nine-year-old boy with sun-kissed blonde hair, bright blue eyes, a face like a cherub that made him look a little like a chibi and the cutest birthmarks she had ever seen that looked like whiskers on his cheeks. Though his clothes could have been better. His outfit was an orange tracksuit with blue on the upper shoulders and up and down the front. There was a white swirl with a tassel on the left side, a red swirl on the back, a big white collar, orange pants, blue sandals, and a pair of goggles resting on his forehead. She had no idea what a child was doing in such a horrible outfit. Hey, 
Ojasan, are you ready to give me that hat right now? yelled the blonde with whiskers as he strode into the room. The secretary stood in the doorway looking sheepish. I'm so sorry, Hokage sama, she said. I tried to tell him you were in a meeting, but. It's okay, said Serutobi. I know how hard it is to stop him from doing something when he's set on it. Don't worry, I'll take care of him. The secretary nodded and left. You do know it's rude to bother the Hokage when he's in a meeting, don't you, Naruto-kun? He asked the blonde who was grinning. Naruto blinked for a few minutes before he rubbed the back of his head, smiled sheepishly, and said, Hee hee, sorry, Ojasan. He paused and looked at Mei, then turned to the Hokage and asked, Hey, who's the pretty lady? You're not hitting on her, are you? What? No, I'm not perving on her, Sarutobi said with a scowl and a light blush. Mei actually liked the strange and funny new twist that the blonde girl added to the conversation. Yeah, whatever, you pervy old man, Naruto replied. Anyway, I'm making this really cool jutsu that will be so strong that it will totally beat you. Then you'll have to give me that hat and make me hokage. Yes, yes, but until you make that jutsu and beat me, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the room until my meeting is over, Serutobi said in a calm voice that told Mei he had done this many times before. Oh, no. Do I have to? Naruto asked with a whine. Yes, you have to, Serutobi said. Fine, the blonde said, shaking his finger at the Hokage. But get ready to lose that hat the next time I see you. With that, he walked back out of the room and slammed the door, not even looking at Mei or her bodyguard. I'm terribly sorry about him, Serutobi told Mei. He lost his parents in the Kyubi attack and has turned into a prankster who likes to break the rules. That's fine. May said with a light shrug. Our business was pretty much done. Since we got an answer, I think we'll find a hotel to stay the night and leave first thing in the morning. Very well, said Serutobi. Once again, I'm sorry I can't help you. May let out a sad sigh and said, I'm sure. Naruto watched from a building a few dozen feet away from the Hokage residence as the pretty woman with red hair and the man with blue hair and a sword left and went into the city. So, Akane-chan, what do you think? Hum, thought Akane, tapping her chin as she looked at the two of them through Naruto's eyes. This is definitely a chance for us to learn something. Have a cage bunch and follow them so you know where they're going to stay. We don't want to show up just as they leave their meeting with the Hokage or it will draw attention. That's true, and if I'm going to fight in a war, I'll have to make a new Chishio bunch because I don't know how long I'll be gone. As he thought this, a clone appeared to his left, changed into an ordinary woman, and landed in the alley next to them. While this was going on, Naruto went to his apartment complex. As Naruto walked up to his door, he put his hands in a small circle that held a set of seals. When he sent Chakra to the seals, they became visible right away. The seals looked like his resistance seals. They were two small circles with a pattern that looked like chains going out from them. As he started to channel more Chakra, the chains started to snake and wind around the circle, getting smaller and smaller until they fit perfectly inside the two circles. Naruto opened the door to his room and walked in. Naruto's first step was to make his Chishio Bunshin. For the past year, he had been draining his blood several times a week so that he would have enough on hand when he needed to make his special form of Bunshin. Naruto took a two-gallon bucket of blood from a secret pocket in a cabinet in his kitchen and took it to the training ground, where he put it down. Ready? Asked Akane. All set, Naruto said as he put his hands into the thick red liquid and started to concentrate. While he and Akane were both channeling their own energies, the blonde with whiskers was also seeing himself in his mind. Akane's special abilities, unlike human jutsu, were all based on intent. There were no hand signs or shouting out the name of your jutsu. You just had to think about what you wanted to happen and use your chakra, or in Akane's case, Yuki. The blood in the bucket started to bubble, and as it slowly rose into the air, it looked like a hand was sticking out of the red liquid. Soon, more and more came out and the bucket fell over when blood started to form outside of it. Soon, there were two legs, then some feet, then two arms and hands, fingers, toes, and a head. The head had a mouth, a nose, and a pair of eyes. It also had spiky hair like Naruto's. It was still blood, though. Soon, that started to change. Starting with the feet, it started to get skin. It moved slowly up the body, and when it got to the chest, the skin split into three different parts, the arms and the head, when the jutsu was finally done, there stood in front of Naruto an exact copy of himself. You already know what to do? Naruto asked. Of course, don't worry, 
Boss, I've got it all covered, Chishio Naruto said with a smirk. Okay, since it's summer, you're free to do whatever you want. Try to make as much trouble as you can. Chishio Naruto's smile grew wider, and he said, Don't worry, I will. Mei Terumi sighed as she got out of her long, hot bath. It was a small treat for her. Now wearing a simple bathrobe, the young beauty with auburn hair was sitting on the couch and drinking hot tea. I can't believe I wasted a month-long trip to come here, she said as she thought about her meeting with the Hokage. Even now, she felt disappointed, not just in Hiruzen for not helping her, but in herself for thinking he would. Ao did try to warn me that this might happen. I hope he and the others are all right. Then, someone knocked on the door. Mei blinked, stood up, and walked over carefully. Who is it? Someone who's heard about your situation and wants to help, a voice said from behind the door. Both the sound of the voice and the words said made her blink. When Mei opened the door, she saw a handsome man with red hair and purple eyes standing in the hallway. He was wearing a dark blue kimono, a black hakama, tabi socks, and waraji. Even the man seemed to be looking at her, but Mei was surprised that he didn't blush. Well, that's not something you see every day, he said in a light tone. This woman was one of the most beautiful he had ever seen, but compared to Akane, she was just average. Mei looked down and saw that she was still wearing the same clothes. She was very red before she muttered, excuse me for a second, and closed the door. Mei opened the door again after putting on her regular clothes. Now, what was it that you were saying? I was just saying that I had heard about your problems in Kiri and how you were looking for help, the redhead said, keeping his eyes on hers. I don't like people who hate others for no good reason just because they are different, so I decided to offer my services to you. I see, said Mei, and how did you hear about my request for help? I have great hearing, and what you were saying to yourself was something about disappointing old monkeys, he said with a light shrug. Mei asked with a blush, did I really say that? You did. Mei took a moment to look at the man in front of her again. Other than his good looks, there wasn't much that stood out about him. I hope you don't mind me asking, but what can you give me that would make me want your help? Now came the hard part. Naruto and Akane didn't know how much information they should share about him to make him seem like a good cash. In the end, they agreed that there was one thing they could show her that might make her agree. Naruto called up his blade by putting out his hand, letting Mei see the black dato that was only his. Hitokage no Yeba, Mei said, her eyes as wide as they could go, even if you could only see one of them. She looked at the hairy man with a small grin on his face and said, You're an Uzumaki. Titarumi sama are you sure these guys will show up? Asked the swordsman with blue hair as he stood next to his beautiful leader at the north gate. Of course, I'm Chojuro, Mei said in a calm voice. I told him to be here at 8, but we still have 10 minutes. Please be patient. Chojuro didn't say anything because he didn't want to go against what his leader thought. Mei was right, though, because the man she had talked about could be seen walking toward them in less than 10 minutes. The man smiled and said, Mei-san, I hope you had a good night. It was nice, Mei said. Konoha is a pretty quiet village. She paused and raised an eyebrow before asking, Arashi-san, do you think you're all ready to go? Of course, said Arashi with a laugh. I finished my business a few days ago, so I was mostly just relaxing before I started traveling again. Mei said, then we should leave, and the three of them walked out of the north gate together. Soon after, they climbed into the trees and took the shortest path to the small port town where Mei and Chojuro had come from. Irashi used the quiet time he spent traveling to talk to his inner demon. Akane-chan, have you ever been to Mizu no Kuni? Once or twice, Akane paused, Biju rarely left the countries they were sent to watch over. But I did travel a bit when I heard that the other Biju were being captured and sealed. I went to Mizu no Kuni while I was traveling. Mei and Chojuro were keeping an eye on Arashi while he was talking to his inner vixen. Mei was especially interested in him, and Chojuro wanted to see the Uzumaki bloodline up close. The three people walked for five hours and stopped when the sun started to go down. Mei looked at Arashi and said, Okay, now that we're out of Konoha, why don't you tell me how you really found out about my request? The way she said it made it clear that she wasn't asking him. Irashi laughed a little and rubbed the back of his head as he said, I should have known my excuse would seem weak. Unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly how I heard about your visit to the Sandame, he said to Mei's frown, but I can tell you that not much happens in that village without me hearing about it. Mei raised an eyebrow because the way he was talking made it sound like he had a spy network in Konoha or something similar. 
She thought for a moment about how he could have a network so big that he could sneak into the Hokage's room without being seen. Chojuro, meanwhile, was suspicious of Arashi. Teitarumi Sama, how do we know we can trust him? You can't, Arashi told the swordsman with blue hair about Mei's question. You can either believe me when I say I want to help you, or you don't. But you two are ninja, so I wouldn't expect you to trust me until I can prove myself to you. I'll trust you for now, Mei said. But if you do anything to make me think you're being dishonest, I'll take care of you. Understand? She asked in a voice so sickly sweet that it sent shivers down Naruto's spine. You know, I like her a little bit. You would, Naruto said with a smile, avoiding a frown. I understand perfectly. The whole trip through Hai no Kuni took a week. It would have taken less time, but they ran into a group of bandits who were dumb enough to say they were going to ride the pretty little redhead until she was all used up. As a result, Naruto saw the most brutal killings he had ever seen. Even though Chojuro didn't have much confidence, he used his sword, Haramekure, when he heard that Mei had been insulted. It was interesting to see how the sword worked. The Haramekure had two holes at the top of the blade that could shoot out chakra, which Chojuro seemed to be able to use to make weapons like a hammer. The only problem was that the weapon made him tired quickly. But even though Chojuro's weapon and skills were impressive, it was Mei's ability that really caught Naruto's attention. She was very aware in battle and could pick up on small differences in people's personalities. She had a very powerful taijutsu style, which Naruto saw when she kicked a man straight through a tree. She wasn't as strong as Tsunade, a student of the Sandame Hokage who was said to be able to crush rocks with a flick of the finger, but she was still strong. But it was the way she was able to control nature that really got Naruto's attention. Mei could use the earth, fire, and water elements. She also had two Keke Genke, which are similar to the Uzumakis but are based on the elements. The first one let her use Yotan, lava release, ninjutsu by combining earth and fire. This gave her the ability to do things like spit out lava that could melt almost anything in its path. After the lava strikes, there was a lot of steam, which worked well as a smokescreen, giving her time to attack again while the enemy was distracted. During the fight, she used this power so well that Naruto almost felt bad for the man whose balls she melted off. The second allowed her to use Futen, boil release, ninjutsu by combining water and fire. This gave her the ability to release a corrosive mist that could burn anything it touched. After the battle, she told him that she could change how strong and acidic the mist was that her Futen techniques made, and that the mist didn't seem to affect her. They got to a small port town and made plans to go to Mizu no Kuni, land of water, which was the country where Kirigakir was. Irashi closed his eyes and smiled as the wind blew against his face. He took a deep breath as the smell of the ocean filled his senses. For someone who liked to try new things, it was an exciting time. He didn't start traveling until last year, so he had never been out to sea before. It was a great experience that he should definitely try again at some point. May said it would take two weeks to get to the shores of Mizu no Kuni and another week to reach the rebel camp. Given that he was likely to be integrated into the war very soon, the redhead felt it would be wise to enjoy what peace he had left. You could enjoy some of that peace here in the seal with me, Akane suggested with a smile that went unseen. I was thinking we could make a beach and I could even do some suntanning, topless. Irashi felt his face heat up at her comment as the image of a topless Akane came to his mind. Can you please, please not say things like that when I'm in public? What's wrong Naruto-kun? I thought you would like the images that provoked. I do, no wait, I don't, no wait, it just that. He was cut off by Akane's giggle, oh my, you're so fun Naruto-kun. Irashi scowled as the woman's laughter faded, he was so glad this body was only real in its looks. If his transformation had made his body the same as any other 18 year old, then he would have needed a cold shower right about now. A very cold shower. Enjoying the weather. Turning his head Arashi saw Mei walking up behind him with the same cheerful smile on her face that she always had. He quickly shoved Akane's words into the back of his mind, lest he begin stripping the auburn-haired beauty in front of him with his eyes. More like the experience, Arashi said as he turned back to look out at the ocean. I've never traveled by sea before, it's surprisingly soothing. The weather is nice too though, he added at the end. Mei smiled as she changed the subject. It will only be a few more days before we reach the port of Fuwato Kaiko, floating harbor, then we'll be in Mizu no Kuni. Mizu no Kuni was one of the five great shinobi nations and contained the hidden village of Kirigakure, 
it was composed of many islands, with each having its own unique traditions. During their travel towards the port in Konoha, Irashi had Mei tell him what she knew of Mizu no Kuni's geology. What kind of situation can we expect to find once we get there? Asked Arashi. I don't know, Mei sighed, I left my people in capable hands but during a war, even the smallest amount of time can change the tides, causing the balance of power to shift from one side to the other. For all I know the war could already be over and we could be walking to either our deaths, or our victory. That sounds a little extreme, Irashi said with a small frown. Maybe, but that's what things are like in a war. Mei looked at him for a few seconds longer before saying, Anyways, make sure you're ready to leave by the time we reach port. As soon as we're on dry land, we'll be in enemy territory. Irashi watched her walk away. Turning back to look out at the sea he muttered, Lady, I'm always ready. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf The port town the three of them got off at had definitely seen better days, the ships that would normally be bustling in and out of the port were almost non-existent, with there only being one or two ships in the dock. Most of the buildings were run down and had rust staining many different areas, making it obvious they either did not have the resources or the people to maintain appearances. As they walked further into the port city, Irashi could see a lot of people that appeared to be homeless. Many of them were sitting off to the sides of the street, begging for money or food while others were hidden in back alleys and side streets. What was worse was that Arashi could see whole families who were homeless, little children who were even more malnourished than he had been when trying to scrounge a living in the streets of Konoha. The place was definitely bleak, if this was how things were looking under the current Mizukage's rule then he could see why people like Mei were fighting. They slowly worked their way through the city, being careful not to attract attention. Arashi saw several ninja wearing Kirigakir forehead protectors jumping from the roofs, the place was teeming with ninja that were loyal to the Mizukage, now he understood what Mei meant when she said enemy territory. No matter where he looked there was an enemy somewhere in his sight. When they reached the edge of the city Arashi spotted a middle-aged man wearing an eye patch over his right eye. He was wearing a talisman in each ear with the kanji for a humble form of Tahir, Sho, Yukatamawa, Ru, written on them twice on each side. He also had on a striped shirt and pants with seemingly the same pattern, with a green robe over them. His blue hair was pointed up in a single spike that looked slightly slanted. Over all that he wore a bluish-green kimono and a striped undershirt. Ow! Mei said with a smile, it is good to see you are well, but why are you the one picking us up? I thought Kira was going to be coming. I felt it would be best if I came personally, the man known as Ao replied. I see, though her smile remained in place Arashi could sense attention to the woman that had not been there before. It was enough to put him on guard, well I'm glad to see you're taking things so seriously, I feel much safer in your hands. Mei and Chojuro shared a meaningful look, one that Arashi caught easily. Things remained tense as they moved out of the city and into the surrounding swampy woodlands. However, before they moved too far Mei and Chojuro attacked Ao, who managed to jump out of the way just in time to keep himself from getting killed. Who are you? Shouted Mei as she glared at the man who Naruto figured was an imposter. Ao would have never abandoned his post when I gave explicit instructions to hold the fort. Tell me who you are. Who I am doesn't matter, the man said, his voice sounding different, gruffer, than before. Because you're going to die, a dozen Kiri ninja appeared from the surrounding trees. Mei Terumi, we've been waiting a long time to kill you, with you gone the bloodline rebels won't have anyone to look up to. How did they find out about us? Asked Mei, wondering how they knew she had left Kiri and when they would get there. Mei San, can you do a suishoha, water shockwave? asked Arashi. Of course, said Mei, she would have scoffed at the question were the situation not so seriously. Then do so. Mei blinked at the commanding note in the red haired Mon's voice, had this been a normal situation, she would have questioned why he was ordering her around. As it was, she found herself performing the hand seals at near blinding speed. One of Mei's greatest strengths had always been her hand seal speed which was faster than most ninja could ever hope to keep up with in their life. Sweden. Suishuha, water release, water shockwave, because Mizu no Kuni was nothing more than a string of islands, water was an extremely abundant resource. The area that Naruto, Mei and Chojuro were standing had several rivers and streams that connected to the sea. So when Mei called out her jutsu, water from every direction surged towards them, creating a large vortex. Before anything else could happen Naruto slammed his hands on the ground. Large cracks appeared around him in the rebel leader and her bodyguard, right before several gouts of flame burst up from the cracks. 
The fire hit the vortex of water, creating a thick mist that was impossible for anyone to see through. What the hell? Damn it, I can't see. Who cares? Just launch your jutsu at their last location. Voice shouted from all around them, and Mei was trying to figure out what Arashi was doing, and what she herself should be doing. The situation was soon taken out of her hands as she felt herself being scooped up into a pair of arms almost faster than she could react, her instincts almost led her to lash out at whoever had grabbed her. She flicked one of the kanai that she kept secured in her sleeves and was about to stab the person carrying her, when she looked and noticed it was Arashi. What are you doing? She asked, both curious and slightly peeved about him carrying her. The boss is taking care of the bad guys at the moment, he didn't want you and Chojuro to get in the way. The boss? Yeah, I'm just a clone. Oh. For some reason the knowledge that she was being carried by a clone surprised her. The clone stopped at a tree branch a little ways away and set her down. Where's Chojuro? Asked Mei, worried about her bodyguard and friend. Over there. Arashi's clone pointed to a tree two feet away where Chojuro was standing next to another clone. Just then screams came in through the mist, and Mei couldn't help but wonder what was going on within the thick, white smoke screen. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Moving as far away as he could be while still remaining in the mist, Arashi waited until the third cage bunshin he had made dispelled, letting him know both Mei and Chojuro were out of the mist. That meant he could get to work. Calling forth Hikage no Ukamki, Arashi closed his eyes and began to sense out his opponents. He felt a light breeze coming from the left of him and acted quickly, running towards the source of the breeze and slicing his sword in a vertical slash. He easily felt as well as heard his blade slicing through flesh and bone, which was soon followed by a scream that turned into a strangled gurgle, then a thud as the man fell to the floor. Dead. Did you hear that? It came from over there. Arashi followed the voices with his ears to pinpoint their exact location. When he found the two that spoke he made liberal use of the sunshin to move behind one of them. A flash of his blade and the shinobi the red-haired swordsman was standing behind was killed, literally chopped in half at the waist as the top half of his body went flying. A loud thud and a shriek let him know the several body had hit another ninja, a kunoichi by the sound feminine tone. Or maybe a man who screamed like a girl. Either way he assumed it was a woman, that complicated things a little. He appeared right in front of the ninja who screamed. Definitely a girl now that he saw her and reversed the grip of his blade, smacking the kunoichi in the temple and knocking her unconscious. It may seem sexist, but ever since he began raiding bandit camps and saving the occasional woman from rape and worse, he had promised himself that he would never kill a woman unless it was a clear-cut case of kill or be killed, and he didn't feel it had gotten to that point yet. Out of instincts alone, Arashi ducked and rolled forward, his enhanced senses picked up the swish of a blade where he had previously been. Sucking in a deep breath, he blew out a compressed ball of wind and was rewarded with a shout of pain. Whoever had been hit would be dead so, no matter where they got hit. He had gotten his futon, rankudon, wind release, drilling air bullet, to the point where he could compress to the size of a baseball. While it was much smaller, and didn't have have as much mass, it was also much more powerful, and would blow a hole through anything it hit. Sending a pulse of chakra to act as a sonar, Arashi could tell there were eight more ninja around him and they were currently trying to get out of the mist. He quickly set himself into a stronger stance, feet spread at a 45 degree angle from each other, shoulder distance apart with his knees bent. His sword was in a two-handed grip and held near his face with the blade pointing up. Sending out another pulse he memorized the location of each enemy ninja. Uzumaki Hajutsu. Yamadan. Cage Shinten. Uzumaki Secret Technique. Dark Release. Shadow Extension. The words were barely whispered as Arashi spun around in a circle. Were the mist not still acting as an effective smokescreen, the enemy ninja would have seen Arashi's blade become covered in shadows that shot out in a long 25-foot extension. As it was they did not see and therefore could do nothing as it cut into them. Hearing eight separate thuds, Arashi knew he had won. He released a burst of wind chakra that dispersed the misty smokescreen. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Mei watched as the mist dispelled and was shocked to see Arashi, whole and single without a scratch on him and all of the ninja sent after them on the ground, mostly dead. Was that Muon Satsujin Jutsu, silent killing technique, asked Mei as the red-haired swordsman jumped to her position. The what? Asked Arashi confusedly, he had never heard of that particular style. It's a style used for silent assassinations, Mei explained, one of the former members of the Kiri Shinobi Gatana Nananan Shu, 
Zabuza Momoichi was a master of this style. While I know of Zabuza I've never heard of silent killing, Arashi shrugged, anyways, we need to leave. Those ninja I just beat were far too weak to be an ambush squad, they couldn't have been higher than Chunin. They were likely only here to slow us down. So then we'd better get out of here fast, Mei muttered. Chojuro, we're moving out, she shouted down to Chojuro was still on the ground. The blue-haired shinobi looked up and nodded. Let's go. The three of them took, Chojuro jumping into the trees to follow them as they sped towards the rebel hideout. Hopefully they would reach the base before the real ambush group arrived. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf Back within the village of Konoha things had gotten rather tense. A series of large pranks had been played on many of the shops, restaurants and even the clans in Konoha for the past three weeks. The first string of pranks had been done the first morning of the first day of the week, when the store owners of several prominent shops, all of which had refused Naruto entrance, found all of their stock and inventories switched out with stuff from other stores. Even the items and supplies that had been locked up were swapped. Grocery stores found their food had been switched out with leather, silk, cotton and other cloth needed to make clothes. While civilian outfitting stores had their entire stock of clothing supplies replaced with fruits, vegetables, meats and canned goods. It took several hours for the stores to get everything sorted out. And when they did sort it out and go home, the next day they found their supplies had all been swapped again, forcing them to work extra hard once more. This continued on for a full week, and by the time the person who plotted this prank was done, the store owners and clerks were all so exhausted from working, and trying to sort everything out that they had closed shop the next day. The second week consisted of two pranks. The first was sneaking into the Inazuka clan compound and stealing several dozen bottles worth of dog piss and pheromones. All of the dog piss was dumped into the various foodstuff of several different restaurants that had refused Naruto service, while the pheromones were set up in a spray bottle with a timed release on the ceiling fans, this way every hour on the hour the spray would launch a concentrated dose of pheromones that would spread out across the room where people were eating. Many people had become sick after eating the food full of dog piss, but as soon as they tried to leave so they could go home they were beset by dozens of horny stray dogs that proceeded to dry hump them. It became even worse when whoever had set up this prank had released the kennel for the Inazuka dogs, so on top of the hundred of strays that had started molesting the civilian and shinobi population, they also had to deal with several dozen large, horny nin dogs. Many people became mentally scarred that day. The second prank of that week had been on the Anbu headquarters. The entire building, which had previously been a nondescript gray color, was now a bright puke green. The inside of the building, which should be impossible for ordinary citizens to sneak into, had been entirely covered floor to ceiling in bubble wrap. The masks, which normally had a painted depiction of some kind of animal had all been cleaned to their original white. Then someone had taken the liberty of paying crude-looking penis right next to where the mouths were. Some even had two penis. On the third week the pranks seemed to have been taken a step up, and the prankster had decided to begin hitting Konoha's clans. The first to receive a prank were the Nara and Yamanaka clans. The deers that the Nara clan looked after had all had their hair shaved into varying shapes, the leaf symbol, the Uzumaki swirl, a Hiroshin Kanai, a very detailed depiction of Kurenai Yuhi, Yugo Azuki, Hana Inazuka and Anko Mitarashi naked and fondling themselves. This not only caused a problem with all of the Nara clan wives, but also the four aforementioned women who, upon hearing of this, had stormed the Nara headhouse and demanded an explanation on the threat of castration. Poor Shikaku never knew what hit him. The next prank was played against the Hyuga clan, aka the White Eyes, aka the Weird Blind Guys, aka the clan of closet perverts. This particular prank had involved every single Icha Icha book ever made being placed in the dresser drawer of every male Hyuga. Needless to say, when the female members found the legendary perverted books in their husbands, boyfriends, brothers' drawers, getting Jiyukin to death was the least of the worries. The only female who did not Jiyukin any male Hyuga member's balls off, was one Hanada Hyuga, who had been given her own copy of Icha Icha. The minute she had looked at the pages upon pages of graphic porn, the poor girl had been blown back into a wall, receiving both a concussion and passing out from severe blood loss. The final prank was not against a clan per se, but it was just as, if not more vicious than the other ones combined. One day as Sasakai Uchiha was getting back from training, he had been busy entertaining thoughts on killing Itachi. It was because he was so preoccupied that he never noticed the small dart flying towards him until it became lodged in his neck. 
He had woken up, five hours later, stripped to his boxers, which were pink and said, I love men on them, tied up and hanging from the ceiling of Konoha's only gay bar, which was where the next Sasakai Uchiha fanboy club meeting was to take place not five minutes later. The village of Konoha soon played host to loud, terrified shrieks, making many assume ghosts were haunting the place. By the end of the third week, tension was running high and everyone, civilian and shinobi alike were looking over their shoulder, wondering when they would be pranked next. In order to maintain the illusion that everything was under control, the Hokage had called all of the Janin and Anbu that were in the village for an emergency meeting. I am sure you all know why you are here, Hirazen Serutobi began, smoking on a multicolored pipe that looked like a child had gotten a hold of some pain and splattered it on. It was only a minor prank that had gotten him but it was still annoying to know that someone could reach his pipe and do that. What if it had been poisoned? Because of the string of really funny ass pranks, right? Asked Anko, a woman with light brown, pupil-less eyes. Her violet hair was done up in a short, somewhat spiky ponytail. As was her usual code of dress she was wearing a tan overcoat, complete with a fitted mesh bodysuit that stretched from her neck down to her thighs. She wore a dark orange mini skirt, as well as a forehead protector, a small pendant that looks like a snake fang on a thick cord rather than a chain to prevent it from being easily torn off in combat, a wristwatch, and shin guards. She also had on a dark blue belt around her waist that connected to her skirt that had an appendage-like sash. Hidden on the back of her neck on the left side was a seal, which had the appearance of three tomo. Currently, she was grinning like it was her birthday. I don't know about you, but some of those pranks had me laughing my ass off. You mean like the one where the Nara clan deer had a depiction of you naked on it? Asked a random Jonin who was instantly regretted talking as several snakes wrapped around him and slammed him straight into a wall. Was that really necessary Anko-san? Asked Serutobi. The woman just gave him a deadpan look, reminding him of just who he was talking to. Right, Serutobi sighed, he almost forgot who he was dealing with. As you know these past three weeks we have played host to a string of pranks. However, these pranks aren't just the harmless pranks of a child, somehow, whoever did these has managed to prank the Anbu along with some of our most powerful Keke Genke clans. If someone can sneak into the compounds of our most prominent clans and Anbu HQ for a simply prank, then they could just as easily do the same thing for more devious purposes. Like say, putting poison in the Hyuga's water supply. That silenced everyone as they realized the seriousness of the situation. So what do we do? Asked a random Jonin in the back. Obviously our patrols and guard points have been compromised, therefore we need to come up with entirely new patrol routes, as well as random inspections and guard shifts. The Hokage spent the rest of the time detailing their new plan to guard against these pranks and the more serious threat of someone who may use the knowledge for more nefarious purposes. They never noticed a small fly that had been sticking to the wall disappear in a puff of smoke. Story of the Ten-Tailed Wolf A soft whistling sound could be heard by Arashi as he, Mei and Chojuro made their way to the Bloodline Rebel Faction's hideout. Scatter! He shouted, causing the other two to break away just as several kanai with exploding tags hit the place they had previously been moving to, then exploding and taking out the tree they had stuck to in a blaze of fire. Irashi swore as he looked behind them to see nearly three dozen shinobi, he could tell these ones were the elite, Jonin, from the way they moved in their flak jackets, which the first dozen he beat didn't have. I hope one of you two have a plan, he commented right before he sucked in a deep breath, and then blew out a large fire dragon that roared fiercely as it charged towards several of the Kiri ninja. Sweden. Sujin Heki, water release. Water wall, one of the Kiri shinobi called out summoning forth a large wall of water that swirled around them as the fire dragon struck. There was a loud explosion of steam as the two jutsu cancelled each other out. Mei watched with a small amount of shock as Arashi used a rather powerful jutsu without a single hand seal, that kind of ability took decades of dedicated training. She herself could only do the Mizu Bunshin, water clone, without hand seals. Just who was Arashi Kazama? Two of us are going to have to stay behind in order to keep the enemy from following. May said as she came up with a plan of action. The one who goes on ahead will go to our main base as fast as they can and get reinforcements to help the other two out. Well, considering I have no clue where the base is, I'm staying, Arashi commented. He was fine with staying here, this would be his first true test as a shinobi anyways, fighting bandits and the occasional small time ninja wasn't really much a test anyways. How far is the base? Not far, 
Chojuro answered for Mei, about a mile out from here. So who am I going to get the honor of fighting alongside today? Chojuro opened his mouth to volunteer but Mei beat him to it, I will. B but T Terumi-sama, stuttered our Chojuro. Don't worry about me Chojuro, Mei said with a calm smile, despite the fact they were still being chased. I am a cage-level ninja after all, I'll be fine. When it looked like the blue-haired swordsman was about to argue she said, this isn't the time, the faster you get to base, the sooner you can get help. Now go. Chojuro knew when he wouldn't win a battle and quickly took off, leaving the two others behind. So, how do you want to do this? Asked Arashi, gripping his sword as he looked over his shoulder at the horde of ninja coming towards them. Mei smiled as she sped through a number of hand seals, we'll do it like this, you may want to get behind me. Footin. Komu no jutsu, boil release. Skilled mist technique, blowing out a deep breath, Mei created a cloud of mist which she from her mouth. Arashi, who had scrambled behind her before she blew out the mist, watched as the first wave of ninja were unable to slow down and ran straight into the mist. The effects were almost immediate as screams of pain sounded across the woods, the men who had ran afoul of the mist were being melted. Of course, only about five of the nearly five dozen ninja ran into the mist. The rest were able to circumvent the ever-expanding cloud. Irashi dispelled his sword and went through a series of hand seals for one of his more powerful jutsu. Futen. Uzumaki Koku no Jutsu, Wind Release, Cutting Winds of the Whirlpool. The jutsu was his only original technique, it had taken him five months to come up with the idea for the jutsu, another two to figure out the hand seals, and three months of having 200 cage bunshin, all enhanced with Akane's yuki, practicing it to complete. The jutsu itself, was not that complicated in what it did, but the amount of control one had to have over their wind chakra was astronomical. It had taken coming up with several of his own advanced exercises to train his wind nature beyond that of what was normally considered mastery. That had also extended the amount of time it took to master the jutsu, making it take a year and three months with 200 cage bunshin each day to truly complete. Sucking in a deep breath, Irashi blew out a large stream of wind that soon became a spinning vortex of power-cutting winds. The air rippled as the wind tore through the ground and trees, the shimmering form of the jutsu was shown as a giant whirlpool, nearly 65 feet in diameter. The ninja who had been in front of them didn't stand a chance, the winds tore through them like paper, shredding their bodies to the point where they didn't even look human, just lumps of bleeding flesh that was blown away by the fierce winds that the technique caused. Even the near dozen ninja that had not been caught in the epicenter of the blast were not left unharmed, those who were too close were sucked right into the jutsu, suffering the same fate as those who had been struck by the full force of the attack. While those who were too far away for the jutsu to suck up, were blown away and sent flying in a dozen different directions. By the time the jutsu had died down, 22 of the ninja that had been after them were dead, while another dozen had been blown away and the last dozen escaped unscathed. S such incredible power. Mei thought in shock, he channeled insane amounts of wind chakra into his lungs, then manipulated it into a condensed whirlpool-like spiral and added wind blades into the mix, combining the two main uses of wind chakra into one fierce jutsu. Not only that, but he managed to add a rotating affect to the whirlpool, which sucked all those within a several foot radius into its power, and expelling those who were too far away. That kind of nature manipulation is off the charts. I don't even know if I would be capable of doing something like that. Shocking Mei out of her thoughts, Arashi began to cough violently and fell to a knee, he placed one hand on the ground while his other went to his mouth as he began coughing up blood. D damn it, it's still not truly complete, Akane-chan, damage assessment? You managed to cut up the inside of your lungs and throat, Akane said as she began channeling her yuki into his damaged organs to regenerate them. Thankfully, you didn't tear your lungs apart like you did the last time you tried this. I don't think you'll be able to fully master this jutsu until you become a hanyu. You simply don't have enough chakra to use the jutsu and liberally coat your lungs and throat for protection at the same time. Right. Note to self, wait until Hanyu to use jutsu again. Are you alright, Arashi-san? Asked Mei as she leaned over him. Yeah, that jutsu still isn't complete, so it takes a toll on my body to use, he said. Looking towards the area of destruction his jutsu caused he added, I apologize, but until my lungs heal I won't be much help for the rest of this fight. Mei looked over to see what he meant and realized that there were still many ninja who had not gotten killed or injured during the attack. That's fine, she said with a smile, you just sit back and let me show you why I'm the leader of the bloodline faction. 
and with that she began running the gauntlet on hand seals, her movements so fast even Arashi could barely see them. Yotan. Jinsoku Yutama, Lava Release, Rapid Fire Lava Bullets. Mei began spitting out several red globs of lava at a rapid pace, and Arashi got to see just how accurate she is every shot fired hit someone. Sometimes she would get a head shot, resulting in the instant death of whoever was unfortunate enough to be hit, and others would hit limbs, torso, hands, no matter where she hit though, the jutsu always melted straight through, even the flak jackets that would often give some minor protection against kanai would simply become molten ash. By the time the kiri forces had gotten close enough to truly attack in force, they had already been cut down to 20 ninja. It was here that Arashi saw how power Mei's taijutsu truly was. The woman's style seemed to be more centered on using her feet than her fists, lashing out with powerful kicks that would literally break bones with each hit. Oftentimes the person that would get caught by one of her attacks would be sent flying into and sometimes through a tree. Several of the ninja tried to catch her off guard by combining their chakra for a powerful Sweden jutsu, but thanks to Mei's dual sub-elemental Keke Genke their attacks might as well have been buildings blocks thrown by a toddler having a temper tantrum. When the Kiri forces launched a combined water dragon at her, Mei created a power wall of lava that rendered the attack ineffectual and consequently saved her from several kanai that had been thrown in the hopes she would be caught off guard. Mei had then caught the entirety of the enemy ninja off guard by melting the wall back into lava and using it to create a powerful wave that swept the majority of the enemy forces away, right until they all melted down to their base components. There. Mei said as she clapped her hands together in a manner that said she was finished. She turned to Arashi and smiled, how was that? Not bad. Arashi said as he stood up, his lungs were healing along nicely and he could finally breath properly now. Using his quick reflexes he flicker a kanai that sailed right towards Mei and passed by her cheek, a thud was heard and Mei turned around to see an enemy shinobi with the same kanai Arashi had just thrown lodged between his eyes. She turned back to her red-haired companion and saw a smirk on his face, but you missed one. Mei couldn't help it as she burst out laughing, the absurdity and slight anticlimactic ending from that line was just too amusing to her. Letting out a little chuckle himself, Arashi was going to speak up when a voice came from several meters away, Mei Sama. They both turned and saw Ao, the real Ao, along with Chojuro and nearly three dozen rebel ninja. Mei tapped her foot on the ground and crossed her arms under her chest, unconsciously bringing attention to her bust. You're late, she said, tapping her foot on the ground and raising an eyebrow at the man. As you can see, Arashi-san and I have already taken care of our ambushers. Ao turned to look at Arashi. Who noticed his gaze and raised an eyebrow, can I help you? So you were Rashi, the man said, nodding in approval as he looked the red head over. We need all the help we can get, and it's nice to see that Terumi-sama managed to get the help of a real man. Need a real man. Mei's eyebrows began to twitch as she heard his words, but thanks to some odd form of selective hearing, only managed to hear the words that pissed her off more than anything else. It's nice to see you strong enough to stand on your own two feet when engaged in combat need a real man engaged. By this point Mei's eyebrows began to twitch prominently and she looked supremely annoyed. Why? Back in my day, by that point Arashi had stopped listening as he felt an intense killing intent coming from Mei. He turned to see her giving Ao a sickly sweet smile that absolutely scared the crap out of him. Ao! Mei said in a pleasant voice, shut up or I'll kill you. Ao blinked and took a step back from the auburn-haired beauty in no small amount of fear, w what did I do? I will continue the story in next part, till then we be boffly.